sin rebobinar. Today we have a very special interview for us, probably one of the most special interviews in, in the program, because uh, today we have two very important guests, two legends of special effects and makeup in, in movies, especially in, in horror movies, because many of the movies that both of them ha have worked on, it's probably that we can include in our top 10 horror films. So without any more to say, please welcome Robert Kutzman and Marcia King. Both Robert and Marcia, how are you? Great, how are you guys doing? Good, good. It's it's easy, it's like French, merci, but it's <laughs> Marcia. <laughs> Again, we are just really glad to have both of you here at the same time. Uh, I'm sure that it will be a great interview and we are really looking forward for you to tell us uh, many, many, many stories. So whatever thing to start on, like, uh, how did you get into the world of special effects, makeup, the both of us? How did you start to love this uh, this art? Because maybe when we see movies or when we watch uh, cinema, it's not the most most known thing. People sometimes center more actors, directors, but they don't know what's what's behind everything. Well, I grew up, uh, of course, in the seventies, uh, mostly. Um, and uh, I was a monster kid. I was always attracted to monster movies from the first time I saw King Kong <laughs> all the way through, you know, the 70s, watching the uh, Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee movies, the Hammer films. And I just gravitated toward that and, you know, started then, eventually started following, you know, other filmmakers like John Carpenter. I was a huge John Carpenter fan. So, um, and then, I was always an artist. My mom was an artist and I was always drawing and painting and stuff. And, uh, and eventually, you know, as I got out of high school, I was like, what am I going to do? So I went to art school and didn't like it because they weren't teaching me what I wanted to learn, which was, you know, how to make monsters. So I moved to LA in 1984 and, uh, took a, a, a short, um, makeup course. And then uh, I hit the ground running and started working in the business. So, and and I came to it late. Um, I um, I like to say that I was the stay-at-home mom that was never at home. Um, and I'd like to put the word out that um, yes, life does exist after fifty. So, and you can make changes and you can change a career, uh, which is what I did. I was um, a, a photographer. Um, mm -hmm. for very small, uh, little things. Uh, I reached out to Robert once I heard he was doing the final Freddy makeup in Chicago in 2014 and said that someone has to be there to photograph and videotape. And can I do that? You don't have to pay me because I just want to <laughs> be there. <laughs> I want to witness that. And, uh, uh, mine snowballed. It went from, uh, doing all his BTS photography to holding glue to helping lay down prosthetics and asking to paint them. And my first makeup assist job was, uh, Netflix, uh, Stephen King's Gerald's game. Oh. And, uh, that was incredible and I can't stop. <laughs> 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 and so, so for you, Robert, uh, you told that your first work was already on, on cinema. You started right on cinema like um yeah, I, no, yeah i started uh, my first film was a movie called troll for oh. charlie band mm -hmm. um i was working with john carl beekler at uh, mmi studios and that was kind of um my training ground a lot of other artists that uh are my contemporaries um we started out working there and uh we um it was kind of like you know, at that point, Charlie Band was kind of like Roger Corman training school, where <laughs> you could uh, work on six movies a year. Um, you, you know, the pay wasn't great, of course. They were very low budget. <laughs> and and uh, you go you, to Italy to work. Yeah, 
Mm. Yeah. On uh, <laughs> yeah, my first trip out of the country was on from beyond and Ooh. shooting in Italy. So, um, and you know, there, we got to work for some great filmmakers uh, at at Charlie's studio, and uh, and it was a great place to learn because they were small movies, and and back in the eighties, like you know the rubber monster boom was kind of, you know, the new thing. And every, everybody was just happy to have anything that they cool in their movies, you know, like, so, um, you know, some of the, some of the effects and some of the movies are kind of crude, uh, but that's low budget filmmaking. I mean, they were cranking out like a factory back then and it was a great training ground. So. And Mercy, what's the, the progression from, Oh, shit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, what's the pro progression? Just it seems curious that you started, like you said, as a photographer, and then you you change the the discipline. Uh, which right. things from uh, doing photography can you carry on to uh, makeup and and special effects as as a whole? I, I think it's um, understanding how it's going to be seen on camera. I think that's one of the most important things is that I'm looking through a camera and I'm capturing images and whether some's in focus and, and some's very sharp, um, it depends on the subject and, um, and color. I just, I, I, I love, I love very colorful photos. Um, I do take black and whites occasionally, but it really is about the color. Um, and I'm really, I, um, it's kind of strange, but, uh, so in high school, if I had my secret wish, it would be to be a medical examiner. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my, I, I, I love the bot, the human body and hearts and so on. So one of my favorite things is finding photos of things that we can sculpt and recreate. So they're not always the best images, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and it's, and it's transferring, um, what's on the photo to real life. And I think understanding subjects when you're photographing, it helps you understand what you're seeing in a photograph and transferring it to an arm, a hand, a face and, and so on with prosthetics. So. But it sounds, uh, sounds awesome, really. It's like a, a great mix to, a great form to mix both of the disciplines together. So first we will start with uh, Robert, if you don't mind. And Robert, one of your first films were Night of the Crips, Hidden, Evil Dead. Uh, for us, Evil Deads are like life-changing. <laughs> I love that. Okay. We got like nearly every single one of them. Video <laughs> Home System. Oh, uh, and how how did you start working on on those uh, projects? You told us like how was your start in the and again how did you start working on on those projects and how different was to work with super low <laughs> budgets to these yeah. more well well known projects and higher budget? We imagine that the budget wasn't like super big compared to nowadays, but I I guess that it would be like some difference. Yeah. Uh, well, when I was working at MMI on the um, Charlie Band movies, of course, there there were smaller budgeted films, but they were getting theatrical releases at that time, which was cool. Um, and then when you're working, when before I started my own company with KMB and everything, um, basically we were all freelance artists, so we would move around from different studios. So I worked at Beekler's for a few years, and then. I had the chance to um, go work on the color purple as a, um, mm -hmm. a lab assistant, basically. I did the lab work on it. Um, at that point, I didn't get credit on that movie because I wasn't in the union at that time. And so mm -hmm. what happened was um, uh, just basically if someone didn't have a job at one of the studios, say, say I was working at MMI or Mark Showstrom's or somewhere, if they didn't have a show going, you would go call another studio and tell them you were available and then try to get on another show. So uh, at that point I was on the hidden, I was working with Kevin Yeager's company. And then, um, and then Evil Dead 2, I did a, quite a few years with Mark Showstrom doing um, Evil Dead. I did From Beyond. Um, we did Nightmare on Elm Street 3 and 
Uh, so, uh, and deep star six started and, getting higher. Yeah. Everybody, you know, as, 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 um, at that point I was working for other people, but the same thing happened to us with KMB was that, um, you would do a couple of things on the low budget end, but if the work was good, um, uh, people would take notice. And mm -hmm. then we started getting calls to work on bigger and bigger projects, you know, and it was the same as my artistic skills progressed. I started getting um calls from other uh, makeup effects studios you know um asking if i was available and if i could come work on the show and a lot of times i'd start out as a mold maker and then have to work my way up proving that i could also apply makeups on set and stuff but the one the one solid kind of a skill set was always mold making if you could make a, a good mold then you could work in a studio even if you couldn't go to set and do the effects on set so mm -hmm. and he's and he learned from all the artists there too that was the best part about that back then was um learning from the other artists that you were working with you know and looking at how they sculpt or or how they make molds or how they paint things so it was like you were trying to pick with whichever you can from from everywhere oh, you yeah. worked so, because I, I guess that it was really hard to make a, a name for, for yourself and to go like up and, and up into better productions through, through the careers. Yeah. But one thing, one thing that I did, once I had the chance to prove my makeup skills on set, mm -hmm. I started working a lot more on set with, for the, uh, for those artists, like Kevin Yeager would have me go to set and apply all the makeups for 976 evil, or, you know, um, I was getting a lot of calls actually um to do promo stuff for like we did uh um a promotional tour with some of the actors um from um monster squad and mm. so stan winston he was too busy but to do the pr promo tours so he would hire guys like me to to go apply the makeups for the press <laughs> the press stuff that they were doing and so um and then once you prove yourself then they start calling you more and more to, to actually do the set work. So that's that's how I kind of built up that. The Fangoria films were really yeah. low budget movies, but at that point we had started KMB Effects Group, and we were. What's your first KMB so, Effects Group? So they they had to you have to you have to yeah. you know pay your dues and get established. So no matter what, you have to take a movie, yeah. no matter what the budget, just to get that business credit and the company right. name out there so what there's, was that yeah intruder but there was a, there's yeah. a vicious vicious circle of companies uh, not uh, movie studios or, or production companies not wanting to hire you if you haven't run your own show and we at that point we were the three of us me howard and greg were mm -hmm. running shows for other people like greg was running tom savini's shows uh howard was doing kevin yeager's shows and like child's play and stuff and then um, I was working, doing the same with Mark Showstrom. So um, what would happen is uh, once we decided we wanted to start our own business, we were like, yeah, but like nobody's going to give us a job yet because we don't <laughs> have that credit yet. And so um, luckily Scotty Spiegel, who wrote Evil Dead 2, um, was doing his first film, Intruder. And he called us and said, hey, do you know any young kids that can do the effects on my movie? Because I don't have any money. And we're like, well, why don't we do it? And he goes, yeah, but I don't have any money. And we're like, yeah, but we need the credit. So we did, that was our first film, well, Intruder. Said, you were saying, he said, do you know any young kids? But how old were you? Well, we were only in our 20s. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, how young did he want? He was, he was looking for inexperienced kids that would do it for, yeah. you know, a, a meal and a beer. So <laughs> I don't know. So Just to get, like, your name established in the, in the business. Yeah. yeah, and then once, you know, and then, of course, Fangoria really helped us out because we, um, with Intruder and then several other things that we did, like Nightwish and Night Angel, all these low-budget movies that people were, um, uh, producers were basically reading the magazine and seeing that, you know, because of the coverage that we started to get in the magazine, we started getting more and more phone calls hmm. um, because the work, you know, the work was was pretty good on the budget that we were given so we were able to work on these low budgets and make the work look good so it just um kind of snowballed from there 
Good. It's funny that you mentioned that. We just got this in the mail um, from a friend of, of yeah, Bob's. Friend of mine. And, uh, oh. <laughs> which is great. Which is great. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Look at Robert. He, he wants to show so, some more. Yeah. more oh, movies. yeah. <laughs> he wrote well, like. Been... Uh, yeah. such a <laughs> yeah. That's so yeah. great. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, that's I love that poster too. Yeah, oh, the, what? the Army that... of Darkness poster. Wow. It was the European poster. I love that. I don't think I've ever seen that one. I used to have it. He Ivan thinks that the the poster was different here in Spain from the one in the States. Oh, yeah. And Ignacio yeah. was, he was telling that both of them, uh, I'm a, a little bit younger, <laughs> but both of them grew up with, with your movies. Let's continue and jump uh, to the 90s. And while talking to uh, 90s horror films, we, of course, are going to talk about From Dusk Till Dawn, obviously, which is probably the first uh, film that I was able to see. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> but uh, before uh, jumping in, into From Dusk Till Dawn, we want to hear, like, a curious story. Uh, something about an ear in Reservoir Dogs, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it rings the it rings a bell, uh, because as far as we know, uh, you did those special effects uh, for Tarantino, right? Yeah. Well, what happened was I um, I wrote the story for From Dust Till Dawn, and then a guy named John Esposito, who wrote Stephen King's Graveyard Shift, and he writes on the Creep Show mm. series now and everything. He was going to write the script, but he went to location to shoot Graveyard Shift, and they wanted the writer there for changes and such. So. Me and John decided to find a writer mm -hmm. to write the draft of the script. And mm -hmm. uh, a friend of ours recommended uh, this young guy who was working at the time at a video store. And so Quentin sent copies of his scripts over to us to read as samples. And it was Reservoir Dogs, um, True Romance, and Natural Born Killers. So... We read them, of course, and went, oh, my God, this stuff's amazing. So <laughs> so then we said, so, Quint, what, you know, what do you want to do to direct this script? And he said, if you pay me 1500 bucks so I can quit my job <laughs> and start writing all the time, you know, and, um, and if you do the Reservoir Dogs ear gag and some other stuff for me on that show, it was kind of a trade-off. It's a deal. Yeah, yeah. and so that, <laughs> that was the deal, so. So that's, uh, we can say that's how your relationship with uh, Tarantino started, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, another thing that we were curious about, uh, and, and as you told us, uh, you were like able to record a trailer from, from Dusk Till Dawn, but we know that this was some years before like the final movie and and the final project was, was yeah. finished. What's like the, the, like progress, so the, the process behind all this? Because several years passed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well. Almost 10. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but at that point, we were shooting Army of Darkness, and it was toward the end of Army of Darkness. And I asked uh, Sam and Rob if I could use one of their cameras on a weekend and, their, and a dolly and such before they turned it in to the rental company. And... So I spent the week prior to that building a little set in the studio to shoot that little teaser trailer, <laughs> which is pretty crude, whatever. But um, so we shot that there and I cut it together on video ta <coughs> tape uh, and tried to put some crude visual effects into it, whatever, to use as a sales tool. But <coughs> excuse me. Um, but then uh, it took once we had the script, it took like quite a few years to get it off the ground. First, I was trying to direct it and I hadn't directed anything but second unit work uh, at that point. And um, also the script was just so out there and the fact that it switched gears and turned into a different movie halfway through, none of the studios got it. They, did, they just didn't, they didn't get it. They're like, we don't understand this. So <laughs> it took a long time for us to get it off the ground. And what really happened was uh, Robert Rodriguez became interested in, in directing it and he was hot, you know, coming off of Desperado and El Mariachi. So he was kind of the new it kid. Hmm. And so it made sense to let 
Robert direct it and get the movie made. Um, so that's kind of what so happened. So then you did the yeah. effects, Candy did the effects, um, and then yeah. you executive producer. No, yeah, I was a co-producer on it, and then I, yeah. uh, of course, got the story credit, and we did all the effects. So um, it was well worth it because the movie just turned out awesome. And it, and I was going to make it as a small movie, you know, hmm. a couple million dollar movie, you know, and it turned <laughs> into a much bigger project. So, <laughs> so we can say that. In the end, even if it was like a hard process and a tough process, you were quite happy with the final result. Yeah, yeah. It was probably the best thing that happened. I mean, waiting till the right elements fell together <clears throat> and the right, you know, director was on board. And uh, so, and it's, you know, considered a, a kind of a classic of the 90s. So, no, it's totally it's, a classic. you know. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Ivan was uh, saying uh, that the movie was even like... Projected in cinemas for like three or four months. Here in, in Spain. Yeah. 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 Oh, so that's awesome. People oh, wow. love the yeah. movie. Yes. <laughs> and now that um, special effects have changed a lot uh, nowadays, how do you think that this film has, has aged? Because like you said, it's probably one of the most known classics from the 90s, even for myself that I'm a 90s kid. And I still see the film and I think, wow, this looks, it looks completely awesome. Well, uh, luckily, most everything is practical. There are visual effects involved, of course, the bats and some melting effects and such, which, you know, they kind of hold up. But, I mean, it was the beginning of uh, the CGI boom where, where there was small visual effects companies popping up and starting into the computer graphics end of things. And enhancement. Enhance. Well, <laughs> some of those are just straight on. But right. well, well, you know, like the meltdowns, we had various stages that we made for the meltdowns, and then they would blend in between and stuff. So that stuff is probably what doesn't hold up as well these days. But that that's kind of with any movie that's especially in that budget range. It was done back then with visual effects just starting computer graphics just starting to take off so i think the story is so engaging i don't think anybody yeah, cares yeah. no that's it particular yeah it's, it's, once the, really. the one thing sam Raimi always told me was they'll forgive everything if you keep them entertained mm -hmm. so they, they'll forgive your production values and, <laughs> and your effects as long as they're entertained by it so but, but sometimes also this like you were saying with the effects it also gives like a special charm to the to the movie like mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's yeah. even cooler that looks weird or weird compared to what we can see now it, it's charming at least in my opinion right. feeling that the like the the film is super good but he didn't like the the tv series that much <laughs> oh yeah i i think I, i watched the first season um i thought it was interesting just because it kind of flushed out um uh, some of the backstory Mm -hmm. with the brothers and the bank yeah. robbery and such mm -hmm. um i think they like once they got into season two it was harder and harder to figure out where it was going to go but yeah and now one, one aspect that um you were talking about before and we also wanted to, to talk about this because uh, we think it's very interesting in the mid 90s you were also behind the cameras for for various films uh for example with master Well, it was one of them. The Demolitionist, which Ivan absolutely loves, is one of the <laughs> most favorite. Yeah. Films. And wh what's the experience and the difference, really, uh, being a film director and being behind cameras, not doing special effects and and not doing makeup? Um. Well, uh, it's just uh, you're not much different. I mean, when you're in a makeup department, you're dealing with. Uh, all the departments you're working with wardrobe stunts special effects mm -hmm. you know Costumes. the actors you're working Costumes with kind of hair. yeah Everybody. so you know doing special effects and learning that craft ahead of time was kind of what prepared me to direct which was to be able to know how to work with the other departments and know how to help them um achieve things on a budget and you know uh tricks tricks that would help them like so they only had to have one set of wardrobe or special effects would only have to have one vehicle to shoot up with bullets you know and how to achieve that so um that that training of doing special makeup effects really helped 
me with the directing thing. So mm -hmm. also, I didn't you know when I first got to Hollywood, I didn't know jack shit about how a set operated mm -hmm. or who on the set did what. So that early training helped me figure out what everybody did on a movie set. Sometimes the movie reflects that where you were directing the movie, The Demolitionist, that it was made by a group of friends or at least was what that's what the movie looks like. But in, in a recent right? Yeah, in a, in, in a cool, in yeah, a cool yeah. way, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, of course, you you know, you're making a movie for nothing and you're, you're like uh, calling in all your favors and, and trying to bring all your friends in to, to be a part of it. So that was, you know, even getting Bruce Campbell to do the, say, the cameo was, you know, yeah. it was that kind of show. But, uh, and also that was a movie we shot on short ends. And we shot 35 and mm -hmm. we couldn't afford a lot of films. So the producer, Don Borchers, bought all these small canisters of short ends of film. And so we would only be able to do short takes of of a scene and then we have to reload the camera all the time so it was kind of crazy that way but yeah so now let's jump into the present so mercy you can tell us some stories that we also want to hear um the first stop we want to make uh with you is because you work with one of our favorite directors uh mike flanagan like you're telling the beginning of the interview because you have worked in Beatles Game, The Haunted of Hill House, and Dark to Sleep. So what can you tell us about those product those productions? How do you start working with uh, with Mike and how this process went? Um, well, well, Mike hired Robert for Stephen King's Jones Game um, for Netflix. Um, and that was my first true on-set experience of, you know, touching up paint, adding blood, um, we did the test makeup for uh, the degloving of the hand on my hand, and I filmed <laughs> with this hand, and Bob did the blood pumping and everything else that was needed. So we just, the two of us did that together, um, took my laptop, showed it to Mike, and said, this is, this is what we have. And uh, uh, as it was playing, there were many people behind us, and it was just ah, <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, and Mike said, "Well, I I don't know that we can get any better than that." So so that's it. And uh, uh, Mike is one of those directors I I we always look forward to working with. And it's not, I mean, he's become a friend. Uh, we we love him and Kate, um, and the new babies. Well, they're not babies anymore, but they're <laughs> they're two little ones. Um, but Mike is one of those uh, approachable, kind, respectful directors that at any time you ask a question or any time that you need information from him, he's very forthcoming. It's not like you're bothering him. You know, you, of and, course. And he has the answers. And he has and the all, answers. All the, time, so. the man has <laughs> the vision. And obviously he wrote and directed and edited Gerald's game. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it just shows it's, it's, he just has that start to finish vision, knowing exactly what he wants to achieve. And he's got that great way of just conveying it and bringing, and this is the big part, bringing a group of people together in different departments to work like family. Um, because that first movie that we did Gerald's game, we all stayed in the same hotel including Mike. I mean, he would edit at night and, you know, be on set during the day. Mm -hmm. We all ate together, drank together, relaxed together, 30 days. It was, it was the most wonderful first experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, go, a small, a small crew for that film. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it was, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't huge. Um, we pretty much did everything on one soundstage, um, which actually wasn't a soundstage. It was kind of a rented, uh, uh, warehouse kind of space and um, uh, I think one or two other locations uh, but then he brought us back together for the haunting of Hill House and that was nine months of again in investing with your family to create this beautiful and one of the most visually pleasing series that I have seen in a long time yes. um, 
Femi, Mike Feminari um, is the DP and uh, he is incredible, an incredible vision as well. Him and Mike work like right hand, left hand. Um, and then of course, Dr. Sleep and uh, same thing with that. It just was- and a, lot of the, a lot of the same crew. Yeah. Juggle. I mean, the crew got bigger on each one of those, of yeah. course, but then a lot of the same crew had been props people costume. that Mike had worked with prior, even if it wasn't on right. one of the shows. It's somebody he worked with in the past right. on one of his other, you know, yeah. one of his early uh, films. So, Special effects, yeah. grips, uh, lighting, um, makeup, makeup effect. It just, right. all of us kind of rolled together and it just, it, like I said, it was a great family. Um, and we keep hinting to Mike, we want to get the family together again <laughs> because it's just, it was a, it was a wonderful, yeah, unforgettable experiences. So maybe, are we looking forward for some project from that same crew? Maybe <laughs> something that you have in mind no, right now? They, for a while there, they moved uh, production to Canada for the Netflix shows mm -hmm. after that. So it would kind of... Everyone yeah. kind of parted ways once they did that. Right. But mm -hmm. yeah. and then uh, and then Mike's done with uh, Netflix and he's moved on with Amazon, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see what comes up. You know, mm -hmm. we hope so. We hope so that there's something that we can see in the near future. And in 2023, you have some works like uh, The Collector Three. Uh, are you working on something right now? Something that. Of course, we, we can know of. So, um, Collected 3, actually, that didn't happen. We, no. we shot for a week, and then their financing fell through. Yeah, so. they had some issues, so that's kind of by the wayside at the moment. Um, I think our, our favorite things, uh, 21, we did five productions, or I'm sorry, four productions in five months. Uh, we did a little work on Shazam 2. Uh, Secret Headquarters with Owen Wilson, and that's on uh, uh, Paramount. Um, Last Days of Ptolemy Gray on Apple TV with Sam L. Jackson. That is one of his finest performances. If you've not seen that, that's that's lovely. Mm -hmm. um, we worked on a series called First Kill on Netflix. Um, I think that I think that covers it. <laughs> yeah, for them. But, and then, I mean, if, as far as stuff coming up, we have a series coming out uh, this month, next I think, month, I think. Yeah. It's called The Curse. It's with Emma Stone and the on, Safdie brothers. On Showtime. So. Yeah. So. Nathan. Nathan Felder. Nathan Felder. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Benny. Uh, Benny Safdie. Benny Safdie's actually in uh, the cast as well as directing. And that was, that was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Some weeks ago, we were talking to to Peter Kent, which uh, was Arnold Schwarzenegger's stunt double. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up um, was talking about CGI and how these and AIs have impacted the the world and the business of cinema. How CGI and really the the AIs have impacted both of of your works? Because nowadays we we see crazy things with. Uh, CGI and and other computer made uh, programs. What? Yeah, I don't. I, I haven't. Um, currently, I have not felt the impact of AI, uh, with, with the exception of uh, concept design, although it's not been totally embraced. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, as far as um, CG, uh, that it it, it kind of started out hot. <clears throat> where everybody wanted everything CG. Mm -hmm. And then people started realizing that they needed practical elements yeah. and practical effects there for the actors. So since then, it's kind of become a blend of the <laughs> two. So if you notice that um, television has a lot of practical makeup effects in it now, and with sometimes CG enhancement, like Game of Thrones or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's leveled out. Of course, what's disappeared is being able to do, you know, our last big monster, mechanical monster movie, big one was The Faculty, and um, which was almost all practical uh, for that film. And kind of right after that, uh, you know, once Jurassic Park came out, all the big monster stuff was just gonna go straight CGI. Mm. 
So, but Guillermo is one of those directors that knows how to blend the practical and the CG, that enhancement that he does. I mean, yes. there's so many cases of, of his films where he uses so much practical. It's amazing. And then the CG enhancement, it's literally just that it's enhancement and mm -hmm. it brings it like a little bit more movement or it, 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 it's lovely. It's lovely. He just, he, he's very good at, at directing that um, combination and, and making something really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Even Jurassic Park, uh, that I think is the movie that changed the, the game. Even yes. that, uh, that film uh, works uh, because the, it, it has a lot of uh, practical effects, I think. And that's yeah, yeah, the combination of the two, but yeah, yeah, the, the, it was, you know, the puppets were beautiful and so, so was the CG at that time. If nobody had seen anything like it, so, hmm. yep, train. Because uh, like you told us right at the beginning, Robert, you are like a big monster fan, like, but do you think that both CG and, uh, practical effects are able to, to blend together to make like a, a superior effect per se? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think they, I mean, they almost have to now because um, there are some things that you just can't do. I mean, you can't get your um, monster to, you know, run across the ceiling and uh, leap from building to building or something without using it. Um, and there's other instances that it comes into play that are great. That, that uh, uh, for instance, I mean, this is crude, but on Wishmaster, um, I had to blow Andrew DeVos' head off as the gin, and we uh, did it as a practical effect with just a blood bag and such, and then it didn't go off well. It wasn't spectacular enough, and so we basically made a, a fake head of him and blew it apart with an, a blood mortar and then shot it against green screen and then composited it on to his head for that shot. So uh, it it's that's a perfect kind of mix of the two we had a practical element with visual effects compositing one, one last question before we finish uh it ignacio <laughs> wanted to know how it's like to work in uh, in a movie like it follows where uh, at first the effects aren't like super like spectacular but they are they are cool very to see simple. very simple mo movie there wasn't a lot of prosthetic effects i mean we had the leg gag at the beginning of the movie um with the girl on the beach, but uh, then after that, it was just maintaining some of the um, some of the scary figures. Um, but I think with that one, uh, it was the script. Was it was just an unusual. Yeah, it was a, an unusual script to where I wanted to be involved with it because it was something different mm -hmm. that I hadn't seen before. And sometimes I pick movies. We pick movies based off of that. Um, such as Tusk or <laughs> John Dies at the End or, or uh, Baba Hotep. They're just they're just movies that kind of click, and you go, "This is this is different." I want to be involved, you know. So, uh, Robert, you have like thirty plus years of experience working in the business, and that the like the horror genre right now has like two very different uh, kind of budget for movies. Whether it's, <laughs> movies are super triple A. Or super super low budget. Uh, yeah, yeah. How do you? What's your opinion about the genre uh, tonight, uh, today? How do you see the horror genre and how it has evolved? Well, obviously, over the years, things have changed from because of the. There's really no <coughs> DVD market anymore. Is not like not like it was. So, uh, the revenue stream has changed. Uh, and you, you, you have your, your $10 million kind of movies, and then you have your under a million dollar movies, you know, or, or even 500,000, um, which is really hard for, uh, young filmmakers, you know, coming into it. because they're always squeezed to do a movie for nothing, complete, not like basically work for months for free. And, um, which I understand, but. Um, it's kind of the same thing with the big movies. I mean, there's the, there's the $200 million Marvel movies. And then if you want to do anything in between, you're looking at under 10 million for something that you 
really need 20, 25 for or 30. But that mid range movie is harder and harder to market anymore. So mm. again, uh, referring to both of your careers, Ignacio wanted to know, uh, which, uh, props or like molds do you keep at your studio and which are your favorites for both of you, <laughs> which are the most charming? I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's, it's weird. Sometimes I keep things. Most of the time I try to make a, uh, a finished display piece out of something like Mr. Tusk or, or <laughs> Gargoyle, Dark Side or something. And, uh, and then the, the molds, of course, they don't always last forever, and especially when it's made out of silicone or something. The material hmm. eventually starts to fall apart. Uh, and then there's the other issue of like, how much space pay, paying for storage <laughs> and after a while like you you go through and as you get get new stuff you kind of weed out and get rid of the old stuff but it's just it's just part of the process you, it becomes un, it, it's like oh, i don't really that's old i don't need it anymore you know and you yeah, you eventually get rid of it but. it seems like a little darker than usual um <laughs> yeah i uh uh on haunting of hill house we actually have three things kind of on display. In the back, you can see there's a molding piece mm -hmm. from uh, the living room in the haunting of Hill House. It's, it's way up. Yeah, no it's way, right. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. It's right there. Um, and then um, uh, I loved the statuary room. And so there's a piece of the wall and it's um, a Shakespeare quote. Mm -hmm. and um, I mentioned something to Mike Flanagan uh, about it because I said that Shakespeare quote is is part of what dreams may come, and I absolutely love that. And he said, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe that you said that." I think that was part of his process of of having that there as well. Um, and I I love what dreams may come. So, um, but the a really fun kind of prop. I don't think we can move it. Is um, can you see this? Nope, can't move uh, it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's the it's 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 hanging. Um, there's a, um, a kind of a balcony. We're in a we're in a lofted space, and uh, mm -hmm. it's a skeleton from inside the brick wall in the basement oh. of Haunting of Hill House. Yeah. And uh, I I love that skeleton. It's it's silly, but yeah. Henry, Henry Hill, right? Yeah. Yes, it's Henry <laughs> Hill. Yeah. There's a whole backstory to Haunting of Hill House that we always loved and would love to shoot with Mike because it's kind of that prequel um period um that that talks about the hills that were there um before the cranes so it's it's that was really that was really fun to uh kind of discuss and maybe get some on camera and then it was like that's that's too much more we'll we'll, we'll bypass that um but uh no, you could get your Carla is over there. I didn't think of that. The Bye Bye Man, Mr. <laughs> Smiley. Um, we the dog puppet that we used in uh, Gerald's game. Um, wow. I got to bite Carla Gugino's ankle with the puppet, and then <laughs> at the very end, because we we shot it in order, um, she's gotten out of bed the body's there, the dog's there, um, and Mike Flanagan turns to me and says, can I do the puppet? And I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, when, when the director asks you for the puppet, you just give him the puppet. And um, So then I turn to my camera, and I have this beautiful shot of Carla reaching and Mike laying on his stomach with the puppet biting her hand, and it's just this and the dead body in between. It's just, it's one of my favorite, uh, you know, photos on set. So, oh, cool. um, yeah, I always have the camera too. <laughs> uh, Ignacio wanted to know how it's like to work with Wiz Craven, uh, mm -hmm. because we love Wiz Master and really all, all his, his films. So what, yeah. what's, what's it like to work with him? <clears throat> Wes was always just, uh, he had a, it was kind of a little bit of a twisted sense of humor, but he's a very <laughs> educated man, you know, very smart. Um, 
and uh, just a real good soul, you know, and um, it's a shame, you know, that he passed. Um, but uh, I had first started working with him. Of course, I was a big fan. That was one thing about when I was working in my early days in Hollywood was that I got to work with all the people I idolized, the filmmakers I idolized as, as a kid in high school and everything. I would have their posters on my wall. And then when I get to Hollywood, you know, I'm working with Wes and John Carpenter and Toby Hooper and uh, all these different uh, creatives. And um, so first film that I did or we did at KMB with Wes was People Under the Stairs. Wow. And then we just, we just kind of, I don't know, we, we just continued to work with him because Wes enjoyed working with us and so we kept working on everything after that for quite a bit of time so um scream one two and three yeah scream one two and three mm -hmm. and uh new nightmare, new nightmare uh right. vampire in brooklyn <laughs> and um so um a couple classics yeah and wishmaster <laughs> of course then when i got hired to do wishmaster um i i basically we uh took it to west because we needed we didn't have a big budget um, and either it was going to be a small movie or maybe we could get a little more money to make the movie. And, and it wasn't going to be finding an actor of an A caliber actor to bankroll that movie with, because it was a horror film and there's, it's really hard to get like a, a Russell Crowe or someone at that time, you know, to, to jump onto a movie about a genie, you know, <laughs> a, like, a horror film. So, um, so, you know, basically I had it sent to Wes and, um, and, uh, because of my re working relationship with Wes, he took a chance on it. He liked the script and he said he'd come on board as exec producer and, uh, you know, help us get a little clout for the movie. And it was just, I mean, we were making it just before, was it just before Scream was coming out? I don't know. It was right around the same time. In fact, Scream kind of hurt us at the box office in some ways, although we did pretty well, um, uh, because Scream came out and it kind of changed um, what was hot in horror at that time. It was suddenly the slasher film was back and the self-referential movie that it was kind of changed things. And then we came out with a Wes Craven movie that's a straight up just a monster movie, you know? And uh, so it, it kind of... Uh, they didn't expect it. They were expecting scream at that point now, again, you know? So, yeah, but, but it was a great experience. You know, Wes was always someone I could count on for support while I was making the movie. And, uh, that was great. Uh, it's a pleasure for the three of us. Uh, this interview was like a, a dream come true for, for the three of us. And we hope that someday maybe we can talk again and have like a little more time. And especially Ignacio wants come, come to see us. <laughs> okay, so there's a little story. Huh? Um, I'm, I'm a little upset about, and I, I hope that you would help us with Sitges. Yeah. Um, we did a movie with Adam Marcus, who is the director of Jason Goes to Hell. Yes. Um, so we did a movie called Secret Santa, and um, I had reached out to Sitges and yeah. said, "Hey." Um, would you like to have Robert come as a guest and do a screening of Wishmaster? Yeah. And they said, absolutely. Let's bring him over ready to go. And then I mentioned Secret Santa and Adam mm -hmm. Marcus and to screen that as well. It's kind of a two where you get Robert and you get two mm -hmm. movies and, you know, would that be great? They contacted Adam. They brought Adam over. They had some, um, you know, they had gathered some of their people over. Um, and then Sitges, the 50th anniversary, yeah. landed on the first week of the haunting of Hill House and we could not go. Mm. And so um, I reached I, out. Uh, Robert, the, you went to Sitges uh, as a guest uh, or not? Uh, yeah, I was we, there when I had uh, <laughs> my little grindhouse movie, The Rage. The Rage. Yeah, um, was that? I took that oh, over yeah. there mm -hmm. one year yeah, and I yeah. hit a bunch of festivals. So right. it was great. And I'd love to come back, but ah, you, you, know. you, you, you should go. You should both go to to Sitges. I think uh, that is is a festival that mm, never stops to grow up 
is que es demasiado right. ya. Yeah. And uh, this year I think there ¿Cuántas películas ponen entre, diles que entre, entre pues cortos y pelis son 350? O sea, es es too much. Because he's saying that nearly yeah. like 350 movies are movies and, so, and, and shorts is yeah. is too much. You go uh, to the festival, you you can see or or everything is is impossible, right, right, right. but it's it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I see Angel Sala, uh, the director, I tell I tell him, man, Robert and Marcia, please. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, I'd love to come back. Yeah, I'd love to come back with my own film next time too. That's yes, something that I direct. So. Yes. Just yeah. Well, again, that's everything from us again thanks and we hope uh, to have you here again someday whenever you you're free and you can talk thank you awesome. so much thanks. thank you uh, thanks for having us it was thank a pleasure you. guys nice to have met you too sin rebobinar